there's a lot of places my mind enters, but there's a lot of people I think I think about. At the time, one of my best friends, he is or was a Marine, and so he was deployed at the time. So I think there's a little bit of, all right, if he's going through some sort of struggle, so can you. But then, you know, like I've really who I considered my mentor in high school, he passed away at a very young age um, from leukemia. And so there's, I think there's all these examples that, you know, I'm only 26 and I know a lot of people that have it tougher than I did or had something happen to them. And so I think when you're diagnosed with type one diabetes at some point in your life, it's like, well, my health is not guaranteed. That's like how I first felt. It's like, woke up one day feeling like a perfectly normal person, woke up the next day with a lifelong disease. And so that's, I think, where my mind enters of like, it's painful, but we can keep going um, and keep pushing. And it's definitely something that motivates me. That was Eric Dowds. And this is The Bravest Podcast. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of The Bravest Podcast. My name is Craig, and for those of you who might be new to the show, our mission is to have conversations with some of the most influential and some of the most inspiring people on the planet and walk down a path of discovery, walk down a path of inspiration, and hopefully walk down a path to action. Now, all of this is set up with the goal of helping us all create the healthiest version of ourselves possible despite any obstacles that might fall across our path. Now, while a lot of what we talk about definitely centers in the world of diabetes, I do think you'll find the information and the lessons that are embedded within each episode definitely has applicability regardless what challenges you might be facing. On today's show, we have Eric Dowds. Eric is a truly fascinating guy who has a degree in environmental studies and sustainability, and he's even worked as a research assistant for NASA. Now, Eric's passion for the environment has fueled a number of adventures around the world, all in search of ways for Eric to make an impact. He's been involved in oceanography work, and he's even helped design a national park in Ethiopia. And that's all just kind of the beginning of Eric's story. Diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of 16, Eric was raised in the suburbs of New York City. And he recalls the many positive influences of big city life and what he describes as growing up with all the hope and all the possibilities that allows people to work toward all of their dreams. Now, as we get into the conversation, Eric also shares his grandfather's lifelong experiences with type 1 diabetes. Amazingly, his grandfather was diagnosed in 1940, and he ultimately lived to the age of 83 years old. And it was clear throughout our conversation that his grandfather played a significant role and was a significant influence in Eric's survivor and adventurer mindset. Eric then describes his own diagnosis as his calling card to take on challenges in life. Now, in addition to venturing out on world travel adventures and marathons, Eric recently set out on a 4,500-mile cross-country bike trip on the Trans-America Trail. He then hiked the North Coast Trail, which is up in Vancouver, British Columbia, with a team of other Type 1 athletes, and is prepping now to bike straight down the West Coast of the United States and then head back across the Southern Tier back to the East Coast. Now, if you put all that together, that's biking the entire perimeter of the United States, all while documenting his journey and seeing how he can make an impact along the way. This is a really interesting conversation of travel, of adventure, environmentalism, and really making a positive impact on the self as well as the world around us. Now, before we get into Eric, this episode is brought to you by the new apparel company with a big purpose called Greater Than. Earlier this year, Stephen and Jen Kramer learned that their six-year-old son had type 1 diabetes. And although the diagnosis was clearly a shock to them, their hearts told them they needed to do something to make a positive impact on the world. They felt they needed to use their new experiences to help others feel like they had power despite any challenges they might face. So they created and launched the apparel company, Greater Than. Now, Greater Than is a lifestyle brand dedicated to empowering all of us. They believe, and they want us to believe, that whatever your challenges might be, 
we are definitely greater than those challenges. Now, because of the personal impact resulting from the recent diagnosis of their son, their first campaign focuses on the type 1 community and is branded greater than 1. So the cool thing about all of this is that not only are they designing an apparel line, which includes things like baseball hats and soon-to-be-released t-shirts, but with every purchase of Greater Than products, a portion of each sale will be donated directly to type 1 diabetes research and support. And guess what? If you go to their website, which is www.imgreaterthan.com, order up some gear, and use the code BRAVEST on checkout, you'll get 10% off your entire order just for saying you heard about them on the podcast. So go ahead, head over to imgreaterthan.com. Don't forget to use the code BRAVEST on checkout for 10% off your entire order. All right, let's sit back and enjoy my conversation with adventurer and environmentalist Eric Dowds. So yeah, so um, so I, I'm I'm sorry about the other day. I know that you were you were out on the road, and it's probably really hairy to try to find a decent signal out there um, while you're riding. So no no big deal for us to reschedule today. I really appreciate it though. Oh, thank you. So so yeah, so look, based on your recent Instagram posts and stories and things that I've been following online, because you've you've been doing a lot over the past few months, and we'll get into all that. But it seems like you're somewhere in Washington State, Oregon. I know you said you're in Portland now, right? That's correct. So I just came down from Seattle. Down from Seattle. So so we're going to get into the reason why you're out there because I don't know if everybody who's listening truly understands kind of what you've been putting yourself through for the past few months at this point and what you continue to do. And I want to dig into all that. But for everybody who's listening to the podcast who's not familiar with your story, you graduated from Colby College, and you have a degree in environmental science, which is super interesting to me on a couple of different levels. You work in the area of sustainability, and you've even worked as a research assistant for NASA. So there's a lot going on there. (laughs) And I want to deconstruct your background for everybody listening, but maybe we can just kind of start at the beginning. Maybe you can tell us where you grew up. So I grew up in a small town called South Orange, New Jersey. So it's a big commuting town to New York City. I think it's a pretty interesting place to grow up because you get all the influence from New York. And so I grew up around people that perform on Broadway, but then also are musicians, but then also day-to-day people that go into New York. So I feel like I grew up around a very positive place. Now, Now touring America, I'm realizing what a blessing it was to grow up there. What makes you say that? Um, well, before we get, because so many people that I've met, they, they've said that there's a lot of like hope and a lot of energy kind of missing in small towns and other places. And I come from a place where it doesn't matter what your background is or where you come from. It's people who have been successful or trying to live out their dreams in any sort of, market or any sort of category it doesn't really matter it's like you can be in the performing arts and still be very successful you could be a mathematician you could be a store owner and so whenever you tell your story to someone they always say like how can i help it's always like what's the next step forward not what's the next step backwards and so i feel like that's a really privileged place to come from in terms of that like supportive network that comes from community uh, which i feel like is missing a lot of places why, why do you think it's missing there? You, you've been, we're gonna, again, we're going to dig into what you, where you've been over the past couple of months, but, but what do you think's missing? Um, That's a pretty deep all... question, I realize. It's probably <laughs> multi-layered, but at its core, you know, when, when I think of traveling across America, I think of, of, of hope, I think of possibility, I think of wide open spaces, I think of communities i think of of all those things and what i'm hearing from you is that it doesn't seem that way anymore am i wrong no it's a mix i mean there's there's places that they used to exist off of one industry and it doesn't even just be it does it's not even just the coal industry there's a lot of different places that were booming and now have bust in some sort of way 
And so that's where you have these voids that exist. Um, and that's what's tough to bike through, you know, and it really hits you in the beginning of the trip uh, in eastern Kentucky. It's, it has something like the five poorest counties in the U.S. And so you're biking through what is right outside of D.C., right close by to New York. And then all of a sudden you're, you're in this place and you're talking to people and there's like, you know, they're not as optimistic towards the future as, you know, when you come from a place like New York, where all businesses are based, where you have headquarters of everything, where you have so many things going on. There's so much, you know, people talk about the energy of New York City and it's a very true benefit of being there. And so like, I think that's, you know, some of that sort of stuff of our everything's moving towards the city. Those are the voids that are now left in certain places in America. That's really that's really sad. Is there is there a particular conversation that you can recall at the very beginning of your trip that started your mind kind of thinking about? Look, you, I'm guessing you didn't embark. And again, I want to I want to hold back just a little bit because <laughs> there's so much I do I want to talk to you about regarding this this venture and this adventure that you've been on. But is there a, a you, you probably set out with this immense amount of positivity, thinking that what you're doing is this this amazing thing, which it is, and I'm not minimizing that at all. But then all of a sudden, you said you hit a certain part of the country early on in your trip. And now all of a sudden it's like you you get smacked across the face with reality in a negative way. Was there one conversation that kind of did that to you? I think it's the conversations with teachers. That's the hardest part. Um, Speaking to, I mean, I guess I'll specifically in Kansas, I was speaking to a teacher who helped a lot of students remotely and she was saying that she used to only represent like a small district. And because of cutbacks in state funding, she now almost represented like half of the state. And so when you hear teachers who already are always stretched thin get stretched even thinner, I think it's those conversations over and over again where it's tough hearing people who are dedicated towards te- teaching the next generation be like, it's so hard for me to maintain or I now have students coming from further and further and further away, which obviously impacts their lives in different ways. And, and that's just what gets your head spinning and tries to start searching for other solutions. So I think it's just those real conversations of like, boom, it hits you right in the beginning of the trip. And so you bring that kind of quest with you as you, well, for me, at least head west. Yeah, that's so amazing. Uh, let, let, I, I, I'm so sorry that I took you so far off track at the beginning, but uh, just just to kind of give everybody a sense. So how old are you right now, if you don't mind me asking you? I just turned 26. Okay, so you're a 26-year-old young man who's embarked on this amazing journey, which we're going to talk about. And it's just amazing to me that, that these are the types of things that you, you've been focused on as you're kind of journeying across the country. So let's hold back just a little bit because I do want to talk more about that. <laughs> but but it, it's relevant because I'm really curious to understand, and I ask this question of a lot of people that I interview, is uh, how would you describe yourself as a kid? I think I still, you know, I, I would describe myself as always kind of, an energetic and, you know, giddy kid. Like I'm still always laughing. I'm still always having fun. Um, but I think from going into a kid into my teenage years, I think a lot of my life kind of felt like I was coasting through it. You know, like there weren't too many challenges. School was going fine and all that sort of stuff. And going, you know, into the type one diabetes conversation is really when I was 16, a sophomore in high school, it was like, boom, you now have this disease. And for me, it actually kind of felt like a calling card. Like it was like, okay, now I have something in my life to motivate me all of a sudden, instead of kind of just keep drifting through and keep going towards like the normal steps. I feel like it was the first real big disruption in my life. So, so you were diagnosed as a teenager, but you, and we spoke briefly a couple of weeks ago, just kind of prepping a little bit for this conversation. And, and what you said to me at that time completely blew me out of the water because from what I understood, or from what I understand now is that you're not the only one in your family who had, had, has or had type 1 diabetes. Your grandfather actually lived with type 1 for many years. And from what I remember from that conversation that he was actually diagnosed in 1940 with type 1 diabetes. Can you talk to me a little bit about your grandfather? Yeah, he... I mean, it's just amazing to think 1940 to put it in perspective. If you've ever been to a museum that talks about managing type one at that time, that's when you're using 
I believe pig insulin, that's when you're boiling needles. But more importantly, the approach towards it was that you were going to die with this disease. Um, you know, a comparison some of us can make is like it's kind of like AIDS or something in the 60s where if you were diagnosed, doctors were saying you have 20 years to live. And, and it was really what hit me is when my grandfather, his health was declining. He lived to be 83, which is That's absolutely amazing. insane. <laughs> You know, my grandmother was, they met in college, and my grandmother was saying that my grandfather's um, mother warned her not to marry him, like telling my grandmother, don't marry my grandfather because he's going to die so soon. And it's like pretty amazing that she's like, well, we don't care. We're going to keep doing this. And then, you know, for me, it's just showing that you can live life no matter what, and, you know despite what people say, he's like, well, I'll live to 83, I'll have kids, I'll have grandkids, um, you know, which is an amazing mentality to have. That's definitely a, a, a survivor's mentality, no doubt. What what was your relationship like with your grandfather? Were you guys tight? So I only got a, my family was actually kind of spread out across the U.S. Uh, so they were down in Georgia almost my entire life. And so it was kind of the, once a summer, go down there and spend a week. And so you know, I got to see them and spend time with them. I wouldn't say we were necessarily too close. You know, it's kind of in college, as I was passing through classes, I call, you know, my grandparents and just keep in touch with them. That's where you hear some of these stories and like that. But I feel like when your families are kind of spread apart, you don't have as close of a connection when instead of like when your grandparents are around the corner. No doubt. You know, I'm curious to understand. I, I was super tight with my grandfather and, and I learned and to this day, his voice resonates in my head with so many different choices that I make. And it's amazing because he's, he's unfortunately, he passed many years ago at this point, but he's still with me every single step of the way, it seems. Was there, maybe you can point to like a, a lesson or two that maybe your grandfather taught you, whether it was about diabetes or about life in general that you took through. You mentioned a little bit about this kind of, uh, this, this superhero mentality, like, you know, you're not going to let anything really keep you down necessarily. Um, if that's it, then great. But is there, is there a lesson that you can kind of, uh, uh, speak about that he definitely taught you that sticks with you every day? I think it's seeing how my grandmother and grandfather, how they dealt with it together. It was much less of an independent disease at the time, you know, so for all of us, we just use our pumps, we use our meters, we use all the stuff that exists. And for them, their life was much more scheduled and seeing how my grandmother was a caretaker for him like in terms of like we're all eating at eight we're all eating at noon all eating at four those stereotypes that roll into today but then continuing that into conversations like talking to my grandmother and she's like there's ways I could vote or ways I could live life where I could keep more money or keep things t more towards myself but we should always be trying to help out the community and I think a lot of that comes from dealing with the disease you know she helping her husband and going through that throughout life and just seeing that aspect of we all need to be here for each other. She was always saying that to me. We all need to build a community. We all need to be supportive because you really never know what will happen to you. And so I feel like a lot of that resonates in my mind, especially at a young age. It's so interesting because if you take, take a look at that, and I always like to dive into these kind of little crevices of our world to see how it might apply to what's, what's happening and where we're headed as we go forward as people. And it's interesting because when you talk about that sense of community, it's exactly what you've been doing. Again, we're going to get into it a little bit more, but you've developed such great community around the things that you've been doing as well. So it sounds like that, that, mes that message and that mission that they had for themselves is really kind of taken hold in you. So that's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. So, so let's, let's fast forward just a little bit. You went off to study environmental sciences up in uh, Maine, as you said, at Colby College. And I'm curious about this on a couple of different levels, but it definitely plays into uh, a number of the things that you've been up to lately. But where does the interest in environmental studies come from? Was that something that you always had a passion for? Or was it something you just fell into by accident? Yeah, I guess this is a segment I left out about my childhood, but I spent a lot of summers actually in Maine. And so I went to a summer camp called Camp Chwanky, 
which is funny because my mom always described it like, oh, Eric's off in this environmental camp. And for me, I was like, no, mom, I'm just at this normal camp where there's solar panels on the cabins and everyone's going off climbing the mountains and, you know, they're experimenting with wind turbines. And so it was one of those things where, you know, you realize an organization that puts those ideas in your mind at a young age. And so I think that's why I ended up at Colby in Maine because I'd spent so many summers in there and then just having that experience of being exposed to the environment. I mean, one, having a lot of interest like myself, I felt like the environment's the perfect space because you're dealing with human issues, natural resources, uh, economies, like all that stuff is rolled into one, which I love. And then kind of the solutions that haven't been solved yet. I love that, you know, mentality of how do we solve this thing that's never been solved in the future or, you know, never been solved before. So I think that's like a fascinating, you know, brainstorming and creative thinking. I love doing that sort of stuff. So how were you planning on applying that degree when you left college? <laughs> because it is completely, it's completely relevant on so many different levels when it comes to our food source, when it comes to like, whether or not you believe in global warming, whether or not it's normal trends, whatever it might be, there's so many different elements of our environment that uh, are in question right now, right? Um, and there's so many places where you could apply it, but where were you hoping to apply that that degree? Yeah, so I actually almost consciously changed my job every six months. And the reason I did that is because I believe Sounds like, a typical, sounds like a typical millennial, if you ask me. Yeah, it's a typical millennial, right? Already adopting to things. Um, no, so you have this, you know, the environment, you know, people always say that it's so big. And I believe one of the best ways to learn is actually be directly engaged in the industry. And so directly after college, I was in Ethiopia helping design a national park. Um, then I was continuing doing some research in oceanography. Then I ended up back in New York and was in clean tech and then I was in commercial waste and then I was in commercial energy and then here I am today and so it is that broad spectrum where I was like I purposely want to see everything so I can understand it and that's where I feel like at the age of 26 I'm like I have worked in nonprofit, I've worked governmental I worked private and that's like purposely so I can get this big picture which I feel like I now can move to the next step whatever that is so what's that big picture, though? What, what did you formulate from those different experiences? So the big picture, it huh, depends how deep you want to dive into it, but I think... We'll go as deep as you want. I've got nothing but time. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, one, if you deal with an industry and see how it works, you can see solutions that people often don't get to see. And so I think there's a lot of mismatched energy or mismatched um, what people people's passions are where the impact actually is. And so that's being directly involved. You can see, I'll just take the waste industry for instance, like I'm actually very fascinating working with grocery stores because they almost sit at the top of the community where if you actually get them to do something like food waste, that trickles down to every you know homeowner where a lot of times the energy is all spent at the house where it could just be at this one centralized place. Huh. So that's like one specific example that, you get to see, and then obviously working internationally, it's just every country does something the best, and people should be learning from each other more often. Yeah, you would think that we have um, we have all these, these these abilities to communicate with each other and learn from each other, and there's no central repository necessary that's helping people just kind of push ahead, learning from each other, as you said. Um, awesome. So so you're 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 challenging yourself on so many different levels. Uh, whether it's academically, whether it's from an occupational standpoint, you're trying to kind of pull all these different puzzle pieces together to make sense of the world, figure out where you fit, where you can contribute. And that's what I, that's what I loved about kind of learning about your story before we even spoke. Um, and at the core of all this seems the concept of something like personal challenge, right? So a core theme of the podcast and what I've been trying to, to pull together through the podcast and the website is this concept of taking on life's obstacles um, so we can kind of create the healthiest version of ourselves, the most optimal version of ourselves, despite those obstacles. Now, I read that you didn't necessarily consider yourself an athlete in high school. Um, so what was your first true athletic challenge? Because as we start to kind of build on this conversation, what everybody's going to learn is that you've undertaken 
a number of different significant athletic endeavors. So what was that very first athletic challenge that you put, put in front of yourself? Yeah, it was. So it, it really started my junior year of college. I realized I wanted to take on a challenge each year. And my first challenge was actually skydiving, which I did like the day before I went to college um, that year. And I actually found it surprisingly easy. I was just like, well, someone pushes me out of an airplane. Um, and then whatever happens, happens. But it was done. And so at the time, I was like, what is a challenge that I couldn't fake my way through? Like, what's the challenge where you truly have to train, you truly have to be mentally disciplined? And that was a half marathon. Um, that was like my first. I actually had to train, actually had to do it. And it was in Portland, Maine. And <laughs> I was sore for like four days afterwards, but that was like the first time, like the first athletic challenge where I started from absolutely zero. And I think going into like my high school, I went to a high school where we had pitchers that went directly into the major leagues. Like my high school was extremely competitive. And so I was always like the kid that wasn't athletic at all. Like there's people always joking like, oh, Dowds, everyone went by their last name. Dowds, you can't run. Like, you know, I'm like the kid that's always picked near the end, but then surprisingly coordinated. And so I was like, a little bit was like, okay, let me prove all these guys wrong that I can be athletic. And then it kind of just escalated. <laughs> it rolled from there. So, so the, the skydiving thing, I've actually heard this from a couple of people I've spoken to. I've never jumped out of a plane. I really don't have any desire to jump out of a perfectly functional airplane. Oh, yeah. um, maybe it's just the stage of life I'm in. I don't know. But um, what's interesting is that everybody talks about um, uh, committing to something, but did you actually announce this stuff to the world? Because oftentimes when you announce something, then you, you have to do it, right? You kind of, you put yourself out there. Everybody knows that you're going to be doing this. And that commitment is 99% of the, the battle at that point. Did you kind of put it out there? With, let's talk about the half marathon in particular, because that's something that's a little more relatable, I think, for most people listening. Did you put it out there or did you just quietly just kind of do this in the background? No, I'm 100% uh, a goals oriented person. I try to, I think signing up for races, you know, you can talk about a different athletics, you know, standpoint. And why I always joke with the word is, you know, I'm not a runner in the sense of like I'm running just for fun. You know, when I'm like, okay, I have a half marathon to train for, then I'll start training. But I remember finishing the half marathon, and then it was like two months until I ran again. Sure. You know? <laughs> so unless something's on my calendar motivating me, um, I won't be doing it. And then I find that the more people you tell, it's just like every person you tell is another 1% of it happening. And so as you once you tell 100 people, it's like you're doing whatever it is. And so I, that's where I'm definitely motivated by signing up for like a half marathon or marathon or those you know types of races. And you've got all those cheerleaders also, which is wonderful. Everybody wants to see you succeed if you put it out there for them. Yeah, I think that's true with anyone, hopefully. So, so you, you mentioned that you didn't run for a while after. Um, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you encountered some difficulty during the course of that race. And I'm trying to do, dive into the mindset a little bit. Was there like some self-talk that you kind of went through as you're struggling through that race, if you can recall? Yeah, I think... There's a lot of places my mind enters, but there's a lot of people I think I think about. At the time, one of my best friends, he is or was a Marine, and so he was deployed at the time. So I think there's a little bit of, all right, if he's going through some sort of struggle, so can you. But then, you know, like I've really who I considered my mentor in high school, he passed away at a very young age um, from leukemia. And so there's... I think there's all these examples that, you know, I'm only 26 and I know a lot of people that have it tougher than I did or had something happen to them. So I think when you're diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at some point in your life, it's like, whoa, my health is not guaranteed. That's like how I first felt. It's like woke up one day feeling like a perfectly normal person, woke up the next day with a lifelong disease. And so that's, I think, where my mind enters of like, it's painful, but we can keep going. Um, and keep pushing, and it's definitely something that motivates me. 
Yeah, it's. I'm sorry to hear about your your friend, but it's 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 stories like that that help us push through those darker times and the more challenging times, and it puts everything into perspective for us. You know, it's as bad as things can pot- potentially be for us. It's always worse for somebody else somewhere else, and it's our job, I think, to push through for those people, um, and it helps us grow as human beings as well. So it's a yeah, it's a nice gift that that you. Um, you give yourself essentially, you know, you give yourself the ability to, to, um, to learn from, from, from everybody else on this planet. So if there's, and, and just kind of along those lines, if there's somebody out there who's pondering their first 5k, let's say they've never run before, they might have type one diabetes. Um, and there's a lot of challenges that come along with running with type one or any, any sort of chronic illness, but especially with type one, um, they're not quite committing at this point, right? They're not sure. They have a lot of questions. There's uncertainties, all those things that go through our minds. What kind of advice would you give that person? Yeah, what's fun is that it's probably like a few months before I left on this trip, we actually, there's a there's a 5K, 10K option run in the Palisades right outside of New York. And kind of just through social media and stuff, I just invited people to do the race. And... I was surprised because there's a lot of people's first time running. And so a lot of people, so I think my first advice is find a group of people that will motivate you. Um, I think it doesn't even matter what your challenges are. Having that person that keeps you accountable or having that person that's there to help you during the struggle makes it so much easier, so much easier to overcome that. And then just having a group of people, like a lot of people came out for their first 5k for this and they're, mentality going into it was I'm going to walk it and just finish that will be my first race and I'm pretty sure everyone ended up jogging or running the entire thing and they're like oh I forgot like I didn't realize how funny it would be to be in this group of people where their energy is high and like I ended up sprinting and I want to sign up for my next race yes yeah, that concept of community that you were talking about earlier too yes I mean if you've never experienced the energy of a race it's very infectious so i think that's what motivates you and you then start searching for that energy in other places and i think that's how you end up with a 5k and then a 10k and then either you find a happy place or you keep pushing yourself further and further just to uh keep searching so you've actually started to push yourself further and further and um you recently set off with two of your buddies and you basically just hopped on your bikes on the east coast and you rode 4,500 miles across the U.S. via what's called the Trans-America Trail. Yep. What's the story behind that, man? You just picked up and just drove and rode your bikes cross-country. Yeah, there's... So it was... A lot of my... There's a lot of spontaneity in my life. And I'd say my big interest is I really want to see America, especially after the election... Um, always growing up on the East Coast, always living on the East Coast, I was very fascinating and actually seeing what America is like and having these interactions. And Annalisa, who's one of my teammates, she had biked what's called the Northern Tier, so the most Northern part of uh, the U.S. Okay. And we kind of, it's kind of one of those things that I guess a lot of people joke around, you know, the dinner table or while you're having drinks, she's like, oh, we should bike across America. And then it started slowly happening. And as we were just talking about, I started telling more and more people. I'm like, oh, I might think about biking across America. I might do this. And in my apartment, I painted an entire wall. It was all chalkboard wall. Okay. And I just remember so many nights of like, should I leave New York and do this? Or should I stay here and keep working? And looking back now, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm very glad I made the leap. But it was... <laughs> You know, I had biked around my house once on my bike before throwing it in the car and joining Annalisa and Taylor. So there was, yeah, there was no training, a lot of spontaneity and um, a really probably the most epic journey I've been on. I never had been away for three months and now so, it's going. So, wait, so you didn't train at all? You just jumped on your bike and just started riding? Yeah. So my mentality is that the first two weeks of almost anything will be painful um, and then also I believe in just learning things as they're happening and everything with gear and all that sort of stuff, you'll, you'll sort out along the way. And so I obviously had my, you know, I had been fit, you know, doing 
triathlons and stuff. But yeah, I had spent actually three blocks on my touring bike before uh, the first. Uh, That's, I was going to ask you about mindset in the weeks and days leading up to it, but it just seems like you were just psyching yourself up just for the journey and not worrying too much about the actual physical activity of it. It was just the experience that you were looking to gain, correct? Yeah, and it was really, I was sitting in an interview with the company and and they were like, do you want to start on Monday? And it was in that moment, I'm like, yeah, I'm actually biking across America first. That was the one that like switched over from this might be happening, it's probably happening to like, it's 100%. Um, and then it like ended up being three days later that I was actually on the road at the beginning of this crazy trip across the U.S. That's amazing. So, so there's there's a question that I, I like to ask because I, I'm really curious to understand each each person's motivation um, and how ultimately we might be able to help others find their own motivation. Um, look, there's multi, multiple ways we can be motivated to do things. We can be internally motivated. We can be motivated by external forces. What do you think from your perspective is the most important form of motivation for you? What are you motivated by? I, I'm really motivated to, I feel like I'm in a unique position where I was diagnosed at an age where I remember life before and life after. So moving forward, I always have two mentalities of like, is this a normal feeling or is this like a diabetic feeling? And why I think that's important is because it helps me be able to communicate between the two communities, but then also talk about specific challenges saying, this is a diabetic challenge and this is like a challenge that everyone faces. And so I'm definitely interested in saying, here's how, sharing with others, here's how you would actually go about doing these trips. Um, so like, here's how you do a half marathon, a marathon, here's how you backpack New Zealand, here's how you pack up your entire life on a bike and just go across the US. I'm like super interested in that like gap that I think exists in our community. And you are, and we, we, we'll, we'll touch upon that a little bit too, but you're, you're documenting a lot of your, your travels, your trips, your experiences online. You're writing quite a bit. Um, so I'll encourage anybody who's listening, if, if they're interested, you've got a wealth of knowledge that you've published online in different forms on different websites. And uh, we'll work together, and I'll try to link up some of that stuff in the show notes as well. So, so just to fast forward just a little bit, you, you arrive on the West Coast, and it's not as if you said, okay, it's time to fly back to New Jersey and start this job that I was offered. You decided and you got there just in time to hike the North Coast Trail on Vancouver Island with a bunch of other type ones. Describe to me what, what you guys set out to do with this particular adventure. And was that something that was planned or was that kind of typical Eric Dowd's type of, okay, I'm here and this is happening. I might as well just jump on board. So that... <laughs> That was planned. So that's the reason. So a lot of people do the Trans America West to East. And so the reason we went from Virginia to Vancouver was to join uh, Connected in Motion, which is a Canadian nonprofit that uses outdoor education to form communities, but then also teach people about diabetes, uh, to join what they called like an adventure team. So that was 13 of us going on what I believe is probably one of the most rugged trails in Canada, if not the the world. And the goal was to raise twenty five thousand uh, dollars for their nonprofit. And did you you guys succeeded in raising the money? I'm guessing we're extremely close. So if anyone's listening, we're like maybe a thousand dollars short right now. Okay, so we'll make sure we link that up too because we want everybody to donate if they can. So what, what was it like to have a crew of type ones out in the wilderness? You guys are hiking. They're super challenging conditions, as you mentioned. Uh, I, I was speaking with uh, a while back. I was speaking with um, Eric Tozer, who went straight across the U.S. Uh, with another with a bunch of type ones from San Diego to New York City in 15 days. And we talked about the power of having uh, a bunch of type ones together. And it, it became more of like a machine after a while. Everybody kind of understood everybody's needs. Um, what did you find when you guys were out there in the wilderness together? Was there, was there that kind of collaboration where there's a, talk to me about that a little bit. Yeah, it's the, it's all the subtleties that make it such a magical experience. You know, 
one, I feel like I had like a day or two of getting over the shock of you hear so many pumps or like even when we were eating meals, like I'd see other people testing their blood sugars and like I'd be like, <gasps> another diabetic person. And then I realized like, oh, I'm with a team of diabetics. And so it's really like we were going on this crazy challenge, like just to get to so the North Coast Trail is the most northern tip of Vancouver Island. So it's a temperate rainforest. And then it's a ferry ride and then an eight-hour ride and then a water taxi that drops you off just at a cliffside to begin the trail. And so having a team that's there when you're like, they already know what the sound of a Dexcom alert going off is. So people already hand you a bar or like if someone stops, like people will truly stop with you. Where, you know, in college, I was an outdoor orientation leader. And a lot of times, if my blood sugar was low, like I would just be sneaking, you know, honey or something and just kind of keep marching or kind of slowly drop back, you know. And a lot of moments in this trip, people are like, oh, no, we can keep going. And you're like, no, it's perfectly fine to stop. Like, we know exactly what you're feeling. Like, we'll stay here and we'll chat and then we'll keep moving forward. There's no rush. And that just, made getting over all the challenges like that much easier and seeing the empathy in the group is really just you know amazing as well that's pretty remarkable that that said were there any true breakdown moments for anybody on the trip we had this so you're carrying uh you know propane or gas with you in an msr container and one of the girls is carrying it and she's like oh does it smell like gas here and that should have been like an immediate red flag. Like we should have stopped. And then she kept marching and then all of a sudden, you know, broke down in tears being like, I can't handle the pain. And so like some of the propane had leaked out and gotten on her skin to start basically a chemical burn. And what was incredible, is, one, she continued just being like, I'm fine, let's keep marching. But two, like we took off her backpack, you know, gave her new clothes to put on, stuff like that. But like, Within, I'd say, 30 seconds, like, all of her gear had been spread across the group. Like, everyone's like, okay, give me her food. Someone give me her backpack. So, like, within 30 seconds, she was carrying no weight so she can keep, like, moving forward. And, like, that day ended up being the day that we hiked the furthest of any day. And so I think that's the resiliency that comes I want to say that diabetes is a part of that. It's like we're used to challenges. Like we're used to being like, okay, it kind of hurts. Like let's keep going. And so seeing like someone in pain and then the group's response of like, all right, everyone can pick up additional weight, which obviously when you're hiking, that's the hardest part. You know, it's like, and without a question, it happened like with, you know, it's pretty much immediately, which was incredible to see yeah that's so cool that's kind of like that typical breakdown to breakthrough moment where all of a sudden after that particular catalyst everything else changes after that for, for usually for the better right it, there, it yeah. just opens your eyes and it opens the relationships and it's to probably a different experience after that for everybody as well um now i'm, I'm really interested also because just to circle back with the, your your background in environmental sciences how did that come into play as you're trekking across the country, as you're hiking on Vancouver Island, did, did that come into play at all when you were out in the wilderness there? Yeah, I mean, it's always, yeah, I'm always interested. You know, I'm always thinking about what's what's the next step, what's something I want to get involved with. And, you know, I think just exploring, like, things, you know, we're in an old-growth forest, which means we're in trees that are over 250 years old, but these are really closer to 800 to 1,000 year old trees. Um, so being surrounded in that ecosystem was just absolutely incredible. And when you study that and you understand how rare it is, you know, and like there's super dorky moments where I was teaching everyone about like upland bogs and like how you have carnivorous plants here in these bogs. And you know, it's just like that random knowledge that you ra rarely get to share and it's like, you feel like you're in this comfort zone of like, wow, this is actually what I studied. Here's what I can actually share with people. Um, and then, you know, it was very exciting because in New York, I actually reached out to um, a National Geographic photographer, uh, Christina Midamir. If I'm saying her last name correct, but you would recognize her in Paul Nicklin's work in terms of, like, if you ever see a shot of polar bear or ice, one of them probably took it. Um, and she happened to be in the Bay on Vancouver Island, um, which is just like 
you know, if you want to talk about fate, sometimes I believe in it 100 percent. And so like, I ended up meeting her and that was just like absolutely incredible. And hopefully tying back my oceanography work and starting to work with them would be super exciting. That's, you know, what we're talking about now. But those are, I believe, the moments of if you're open to these experiences in life and then also start searching things out. It's like you never know what's behind the door, but it's always been exciting. Why was she out there? Was she doing work out there? Was she vacationing? What, what was the, because the, you're right. There's, it's amazing when, when you put something out into the world, typically the world conspires to make things happen for you. So you're out there for, for one reason. And then it kind of, your background kind of flows into this learning experience. And it sounds like a mental playground for you to completely explore. Okay. Maybe what, where are the things that I might want to kind of adventure into next with professional or kind of um, uh, personal goals. Um, and then all of a sudden you have this person there that just kind of ties all this together for you. What was the reason why she was out there? Yeah, I mean, it's like why exploring British Columbia to me was like the most incredible experience is because, you know, we'd be hiking along and there's a point where we picked up a whale vertebra as my dad likes to say that's a singular vertebrae <laughs> it's like only <laughs> um but you know this thing is basically the size of your hips if not larger and you're like oh my gosh and then you're hiking along and there's a puma carcass and then a bald eagle flies by and then there's a bear on the you know on the beach and so there's just so much wildlife and so she was up there actually filming i believe it's the beluga whales were migrating and so they were getting footage of like 300 or 400 whales migrating. And Trudeau, uh, the Canadian prime minister, he just expanded the marine conservation zone up there. Um, and so her nonprofit Sea Legacy is working on expanding marine conservation zones around the world. So Paul Nicklin's from um, British Columbia, I believe. And so he's always been involved up there. So protecting glaciers, protecting wildlife. They've been in Norway and Cuba, so it's just like a super fascinating. She's in Spain right now. This fascinating seeing like how can we protect these resources and how can we make people care about these areas that they might not live next to but are impl are impacted by. I just love how you're combining all these different elements of your life in, into these journeys. Um, you, you're talking now. When we spoke a couple of weeks ago, you you were contemplating. Right now, you've been riding kind of in and around the Oregon, Washington State area, and exploring that area. But at the time we spoke a couple of weeks ago, you were contemplating actually heading straight down the West Coast and then possibly actually riding back across west to east again. Is that still something that you're interested in doing right now? Yeah, hundred um, percent. Yeah, the dangerous. The dangerous thing is that, you know, I grew up in New York or right outside of New York where people tell you, you know, become a lawyer, become a doctor, become these certain aspirations. And then you start meeting people on the trail who, you know, they're like, oh, I've been on a bike for three years or I raised my kids on a sailboat for 11 years and here I am in eastern Colorado. And so you start seeing all these different ways of life and it kind of starts, you know, I think the big breakthrough that millennials are doing or are on the way to is that you no longer are bound by place. And so I'll definitely be going down the West coast. I'm hoping to convince Taylor, uh, she'll have her Christmas break. So we'll do the bottom tier in like a very aggressive 85 to 90 miles a day. Um, so that would be like San Diego to New Orleans and then I'll continue to the coast. And at that point it's like, why not do the perimeter of the U S <laughs> yeah, you're already home at that point. It's just another, you know, a couple, like a thousand miles or so. It's not a big deal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's... So you, you, peach season's already back. And <laughs> that's so funny. So, so the, the great thing, as we talked a little bit about is that you've been documenting a lot of your travels online, especially on Instagram, you got some great photos and videos and stuff like that. But if someone's interested in seeing what you've been through, learning from your experiences, or just being inspired by what you've been doing, or equally as important, where you're headed next, and just kind of follow your journey, what's, where's the best place they can find you online? Yeah, so I guess last year on World Diabetes Day, I launched Diabetes Abroad. And so that's a travel blog for diabetics. And um, so the goal is really to start creating more actual guidelines and checklists and 
teach people like, hey, here's how you actually go on these trips. Um, but what's exciting is I think two weeks ago, I just put out an announcement to start forming an explorers team. And that's just really a call for people that travel in any sort of capacity from all around the world. And so I've already had conversations with like a recent high school graduate who decided to take a gap year and is now in Haiti. Um, there's people in Australia who are ultra runners. Actually, Amy will most likely be on the team. Um, Amy, so there's Amy a couple. McKin- yeah, Amy McKinnon. She was on the on on the, on the show not too long ago. She's she's awesome. She loves to travel too, and we spoke a lot about her her uh, six month trek through Central and South America, and mm-hmm. uh, all the half marathons that she ran during that period of time. So she's remarkable as well. I'm glad you guys are working together. Yeah, and so like really, I just would want a team from all around the world to one, inspire other people to travel and say, hey, we're already a global community. Um, And then I would love to tackle some bigger questions and bigger issues and say, here's one topic. How does the world approach it? And maybe learn from that. Yeah, that sounds awesome. So I'll make sure that that website is also linked up so everybody can get directly there along with all your social media details. This is uh, just a couple of final questions. I know that you're probably wanting to rest a little bit because you are on a rest day now, I think. Um, the, the point of the podcast also and the point of what I'm trying, the mission of, of what I'm kind of going for here is to get people from not just being inspired and listening to great stories and listening to stories like yours, but actually taking it from inspiration to action, which is a very large kind of gap oftentimes. Um, is to get somebody from hearing about something, being inspired, and then doing something to make a positive impact in their own lives. So what do you think is the best way for to get ourselves from listening to an interview like this and thinking about our challenges um, and taking on those challenges to actually getting up and initiating action? I think the best way is to start small with a friend. And... I think briefly I can share the marathon story is that so I went to this high school all guys high school and and one of my friends James he was a year younger than us but so he was never a runner he actually lost 60 pounds by himself which is absolutely incredible and then came to me being like Eric I'd like to do a 5k you know he was trying to just do the very very beginning step and I still remember going around Prospect Park like once or maybe twice. It was probably once because that's a three mile loop. And this been like that was our workout. Like that was like, all right, just ran three miles, take a bunch of rest days, James. And then slowly we did a half marathon on Halloween in Philadelphia. And then for Christmas, I got him entrance tickets to the Copenhagen Marathon. And if you have a friend that's incredibly disciplined, like someone that lost weight by themselves, they are incredibly disciplined and sticking to a plan. And I was like, he will be the best training partner. And his mentality was like, oh, I guess we're just doing this. And so he legitimately, <laughs> he legitimately went from zero to doing a marathon. And I think that's how it all begins. You know, it doesn't have to be that extreme always. Um, but like he just, you know, started very small. Like, hey, can we do this one race and keep and have someone like there to inspire you and keep you accountable um and you never know where it'll go start small have positive support and you guys will get each other through basically that's the message yeah awesome so final question for you for you what does it mean to be brave to be brave means i think pushing yourself mentally and in my case physically into a place that makes you uncomfortable. I think you should be nervous. Um, And that's where you learn a lot more. That's where you learn from something that you, you learn from the unknown is really what it is. And that's being brave and stepping into this comfort zone or being brave and stepping up for a situation. I think more and more I'm now also thinking about actions. How do you be a leader in a community? so others can follow in footsteps and follow in paths that you never thought you would take and lessons learned from that. So I think there's different ways to find yourself in that. But for me each year or as I bike around, I'm always like, where would I be uncomfortable next? Where could be that next goal? And, and to 
have those really scary nights and have those conversations with friends where you're like, should I do this? Should I not do this? More often than not, you end up doing it. And I think that leap of faith or when you take that step, you never know what will it lead to. Um, it, to me, that's, you know, being brave. That's great. Eric, I just want to thank you very much for taking the time to connect. I know that you're, you're busy. You're, you're in between all these, these different adventures, but I really appreciate you sharing some of the details and insights on your journey. And I'm personally so impressed. And I was impressed even before you even spoke, just reading on your background, but just by your sense of adventure, your mission uh, to demonstrate really that none of us should be defined by anything really, especially a health circumstance. And you're really doing an amazing job expressing the fact that each one of us has the power to create our own story all while, all while showing the world what's possible despite any perceived limits or limitations. So thank you very much for everything that you're doing and continue to inspire and have fun out there. Be safe. And I look forward to catching up with you when you're back on the East Coast because we're not too far from each other. Yeah, I appreciate it, Craig. My pleasure. That was awesome. Eric, thank you. Safe travels. And uh, we'll talk soon, all right? Will do. All right, guys, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Eric. You definitely need to check him out online as well as follow his story on social media. And I'll put up those links um, to his website and where you can follow his travels in the show notes uh, for this episode. So head on over to thebravestlife.com forward slash 014 for all that information. Also, if you feel compelled to help Eric continue on his journey, please consider heading over to diabetesabroad.com forward slash The Bravest Life. Again, that's diabetesabroad.com forward slash The Bravest Life to make a donation to help him along the way. And that information will also be on the episode page for you uh, just so you can check it out. As always, I want to thank all of you for joining us for this episode of the podcast. If you like what we're doing here, please be sure to share this episode with someone you love. And there's so much I'm working on in the background to help support all of you on this journey. And I'm excited to reveal some of those projects in the near future. But in the meantime, I appreciate all of your messages. And if you have any requests for future guests or topics, please feel free to reach out to me through the contact page on the Brave as Life website. Okay, guys, thanks again. I'm Craig, and we will catch you next time on the Brave as Podcast. (music) 